everybody, recording live from somewhere, this is Zach Couples with episode number 28 of the Movement Debrief, and today we got a doozy. What are we going to talk about? I'm glad you asked. We're going to talk about hypermobility. We're going to talk about, what's the deal with you saying push-ups are better than quad sets, Zach? And we're going to talk about lat dominance. Kudos to all the peeps who fielded some questions. Like, man, I got a gang of questions from people. Um, but I try to keep it to three because no one wants to hear me talk for like six hours. At least I, I don't think. I don't know. Um, but that's what we're going to talk about today. But first, some housekeeping. Did you guys see my blog this Monday? We had a great one to, or on Monday, you beautiful, sexy people. It was my practical pain education talk. And we discussed pain for like question with your name on this, my guy. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what we did. And uh, it was fun. You guys should subscribe to the newsletter if you want full access. If you just want to listen to me blab for about 30 minutes, um, you can do that too. Whatever you want. It's your life. Um, what else is going on housekeeping wise? Human Matrix. It's like official people. Um, September 15th, 16th, 2018 in Seattle, Washington. More details to come, but uh, put it on your calendar. Otherwise, that's about it in life. Life's been going pretty well. That was a great week. Um, yeah, this is Mike and over the weekend. That was kind of fun. Questionable photos, but uh, hey, neither here nor there. Otherwise, let's, uh, let's uh, debrief, shall we? First question comes from Anthony on Facebook. Hi, Anthony. I don't know if you're listening in, but glad you're here. Anthony asks, Zach, would love to love to know if slash how your thought process for assessment and treatment changes under conditions of hypermobility, as oftentimes the extremities serving as positional proxy seem to be less reliable. Love the info you are putting out. Very appreciative. Love that you dig my stuff, Anthony. All right, so hypermobility, let's talk about that. So Anthony is very, 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 very correct in the sense that a lot of times when you are looking at movement-based assessments or passive range of motion, these hypermobile peeps are hypermobile, hypermobile for a reason. And uh, you see that they have crazy, crazy mobility um, in, in multiple directions and not just at uh, some of, you know, the maybe the, the, the variability based testing that you'll look at to appreciate the axial skeleton, but I mean, everywhere. So, um, a lot of times, if you're using axial or I'm sorry, appendicular testing to determine whether or not um, you need to reestablish variability for someone with joint hypermobility, get a little thrown off by things because someone might test like perfect. And so you got to think to yourself, self, this person looks pretty good. Uh, what do I do next? But maybe they're not. And here's the key with these people. While the appendicular, did I talk right? Appendicular <laughs> testing can look really good. Many times the axial skeleton will not. Axial skeleton don't lie, fam. Tweet it. Um, so a lot of times you may see people have really good ranges of motion, but maybe the infrasternal angle is still a little bit, you know, maybe it's on the wide side or maybe it's on the narrow side. Maybe it's asymmetrical. Maybe it's something else funky. Actually, those are really your only options. Um, so I would definitely, as is with most people, that is the, the first tier of, of things you need to address. Sometimes what can happen is when you look at the ISA or the infrasternal angle and you make a positive change, you actually may see some movement limitations creep up. And then it's like, oh, okay, okay. That was just a little sneak attack that you had with your hypermobility goodness. So um, trust the axial skeleton first and foremost with hypermobile people because a lot of times that is still limited. And many times that might be the only limitation. So axial skeleton, Rib cage, check that out. So uh, first ribs, uh, it's hard to make mobile people in the first rib. Um, so those would be kind of the things that I would look at testing right away to let you know you still got some, some issues. 
But what if, let's just say, what if that seems pretty good too? What do you think? That's when you have to use some type of coordinative or power capacity based testing from a variability standpoint, first and foremost, to see if that's what's going on and if they can control and coordinate all of that motion that they have. As the great quote goes, with great mobility comes great responsibility. And so we have to make sure that these people can coordinate all of that motion that they have. What do you use for that? Whatever functional or performance-based testing is at your disposal. So for me, with these kind of peeps, I'm looking at an active mid-stance test, which I'll link in the notes. I'm looking at a Copenhagen adduction test, um, or the CAP test. How about that? I'm just gonna, we're just going to call it the CAP test from here on out. Um, those would be my first two things that I would look at. If you got though, if you don't have full scores on those, then you know what you need to address. You need to do activities that would improve upon that. Hang on, Katie Sinclair, what are you saying? I've actually noticed that with my hypermobile peeps that using the diaphragm posturing them in neutral alignment can greatly affect neuromuscular change. Katie from Instagram, baby, I am with you a hundred percent. because I think Rod man, I'm living the dream. How about yourself? Um yeah, I, I mean, it, it's just if you if you can address the axial skeleton and, and put them in a position where they have some semblance of control in the, the thoracoabdominal region or just not even control, that's probably not the right word, but just if you make an alteration there, you'd be surprised at what can happen at the appendages. And maybe that's enough for some of these people. But once you've got you know, variability established and you've done your performance-based testing and that looks good, then you treat these peeps just like anyone else. Can they can they control their their position, their bodies, their you know force production, intensity production at things that are more challenging? So can they can they deadlift with integrity? Can they squat, split squat, single leg step, whether it's step up, single leg squat, lateral lunges, lunges in all planes, RDLs, push-ups, all that jazz? Can they do all that? And if they can do all that then it's simply a matter of once you've gotten them the ability to control position at the very low level, you just add weight or you just add duration and you go from there. So um, point being, and to, to summarize the, this hypermobility rant, trust the axial skeleton first and foremost, progress variability from an active or control coordinate slash coordination based standpoint. And then it's a matter of adding power and capacity and making sure that they can control body position with integrity at higher level movements. Those would be just the basic movement patterns that we as, as physical preparation people, whether it's on the rehab or performance side of things, do. So great question answered. Let's move on. Maybe. Where is my questions? There they are. Okay. Next. <laughs> it's from John Murray 64 on the Twitters. Hey Zacky Cup Cup. I've never heard that one, but we're going to go with it. You tweeted about using push-ups instead of quad sets. Could you explain this more, i.e. when you'd start? Progressions. Thanks. He didn't say it like that. Well, and maybe he did. I don't know. But that's how just I would envision it with the two exclamation points. John Murray, 64. Maybe it's Murray64 is your last name. Great question. So I tweeted a while back. Maybe it wasn't a while back. But it was, I don't know. It was recently. At some point in the recent past, I tweeted, push-ups greater than quad sets. Why did I say that? Well, I'm glad you asked. So um, the reason why I liked those better is because they're still getting an active. If you're doing a push-up, if you're doing it correctly, and you're locking the spine in, in place or the, the body in place, and you're kind of moving the body as one cohesive unit, in order to maintain pelvic and lower extremity positioning, you got to get a little bit of a posterior pelvic tilt, a little bit of a glute squeeze, and a little bit of a quad contraction to lower everything as one cohesive unit. And to me, if we can build another redeeming quality, such as upper body power, while we're doing something that's favorable for the lower body, I'm going to go with that every day. For example... Another great isometric activity that I like to do 
uh, for someone who's had a knee surgery or something like that at some point is um, like doing a low cable row or split in the split stance position. Because what's that? Well, it's a it's an isometric quad with the knee flexed, right? And they're also getting a little bit of glute meat if you let the cable pull them uh, and, and shift forward into that front side hip. So um, that's another of some of my med ball progressions that I use work on those as well. So like maybe while I'm while they're working on a split squat, I have them start the session with a split stance med ball throw where they're getting a little bit of upper body power, but then they're also getting a perturbation in the split stance position as they're doing this. And then we work towards something where maybe it's a dynamic split squat, superset that with a split stance low cable thing like a split stance chopper lift or something like that, just so we're continually reinforcing that position and smoking the quad. And push-ups fall in that same category. It's just you're, you're getting quad in a more knee extended position. When do I do this? I typically will do this once the, the individual has full passive knee extension. Um, and if they have a, an appreciable amount of knee flexion, obviously tolerance to, to weight bearing. And, and it's pretty quick. I mean, I got a guy right now who I did this with today. And go. <laughs> P-Swag! Damon, what's up? Man, everybody's just commenting today. Uh, so first off, I got to give props to P-Swag. That's uh, that's Peyton. She's on Facebook, and uh, she's in the other room. <laughs> but, you know, she doesn't want to come make a cameo appearance. So uh, where was that? Push-ups. Yeah, they total knee replacement. I believe it was three weeks ago. Um, he's battling. Maybe it wasn't even three weeks ago. It was fairly recently. Maybe it was like two and a half. And we elected to try push-ups on an inclined surface today just to have him get more active knee extension. Because he, I can, I can take him to zero passively, but he has a hard time actively getting it. And so we did inclined push-ups today, and I had him lock in position. You know, I didn't coach, like, tensor quads or anything like that. It's like if you put people in the right positions in various activities, you can often get what you're looking for. And so that's what we did. We were able to get an active quad contraction afterwards. It was great. One thing to consider is if you have someone who is having a hard time getting full passive extension, and I've, I've said this before, but I think it's important to reiterate, go after the hamstrings first. For more effective than trying to push knee extension, especially if you got someone, back to our hypermobility example, who has a very substantial straight leg raise, well, if you got someone who's got a large straight leg raise and you try to take them into extension further, you're excursing all of the posterior structures farther than they probably need to go or are ready to go. So I, I would think the lack of knee extension, at least is how I'm reasoning it, is some type of protective move. And so if you can teach someone or get someone control and coordination in that position, maybe limit anterior tibial translation in the case of an ACL, which hamstrings would do, then you're in business and you may see an improvement in knee extension and flexion by doing that. Um, and, and potentially as well, an increase in active knee extension, because if you can get the hamstrings kicked in and then maybe, maybe, maybe next step forward, you restore joint range of motion and the hips and everywhere else, then you, you got, you can bring more guys into the play the quad is a little bit less active as a rotator of the the, the femur and in the yeah and the femur um, because you know pending position of the hips and, and the pelvis um, you may lose leverage of some of your internal or external rotators and when in doubt the quad is going to try to pick that up which sounds a little bit wonky because many of the quad muscles don't cross the hip joint. Um, but, you know, pending the position that your hip's in, there is a little bit of a moment of rotation. And, um, yeah, so I, I would say with, with this progression, as I'm talking through it a little bit better, and to kind of summarize when I would do these things, typically it's after I've restored a decent, appreciable amount of joint range of motion. Um, if it's a push-up based thing, I want full passive extension. If it's like a split squat kind of base thing, I'm more of knee flexion and typically i will go about that by getting hamstrings first and then restoring um, multiple multiple multi-planar positions 
of the hip joint. So we get a little bit less pressure distribution along the knee. And then after that, you, you know, you pick the appropriate progression that the person can do. If you can't do a push up from the floor, then you just incline them or do a band assisted. Those would be like the two things I would do beforehand. If they can't do that, um, you know, maybe you go with some, I mean, I, even like a get up or something like that would be appropriate. Um, Katie, I will answer your question right after this. Um, and uh, yeah, so that would be like with the, the push ups and then in terms of like split squatting and stuff like that, I usually do just like a short isometric first. So you just dip down a little bit just so you can get the front side quad and glute. Um, a lot of times with knee, knee based rehab, kneeling might be problematic, but uh, I think half kneeling is also a good regression to practice as well. So great question, John. That would be my stance on incorporating some of these upper body movements into your lower body rehab. And I guess my company line would be just rehab the person, get them in crazy good shape, and don't be afraid to move beyond the area that you are going after. All right, we got a live question from Katie Sinclair Fitness. What on the Instagram, baby? I would love to hear your thoughts on the Noy Group and cognitive functional therapy and overbracing of the core and treatment of back pain. That's a lot of questions. Okay, so let me, um, let me, let me. Annoy those people. Um, now, I know it may, maybe, it, I don't know, maybe, did it sound like I was poo-pooing some of the stuff that they talk about on my talk? Because that wasn't the case by any means. I was just trying to be a little bit more comprehensive because I actually really like their stuff. Um, David Butler, hands down the best speaker I've ever had the pleasure of listening to. Constant, uh, wonderful human being. I got to tell you guys a story about David Butler when I first heard him. So it was 20, 2013, I think. Yeah, it was 2013 because I was still in Illinois. It was 2013, Atlanta, Georgia. And David Butler was in Philadelphia, and I think he gave explained pain first and foremost there. And, oh, Katie, well, Go on the blog, like right now, and subscribe to the newsletter, and you can hear the talk. Um, and I've also reviewed many of their courses. So Kate, Katie said she never heard me talk about them. Well, I'm going to talk about them today, because they're good people at the Noy Group. Um, so it was, it was uh, David was in Philadelphia, and there was a really bad storm in Philadelphia, and like no plane. They rented a car, and he and his wife drove from Philadelphia all the way to Atlanta, Bro gets one hour of sleep, about four hours late, and we didn't have the the um, notepad, or not the notepad, but like the notes or anything like that. And he just walks up to the stage and just proceeds to kill it for the remainder of the day and the following day. And I mean, I was just, like, I was blown away. I was like, man, um, you know, obviously I kind of want to get into some speaking a little bit more. And I was just like, wow, this guy is just he's on a completely different level and I have mad respect for what, what he's done for the profession in terms of advancing our, our understanding of, of pain neurobiology. So, um, I like the Noy group quite a bit. I like, um, I've explained pain's great. I've taken it from David. Um, one of the best classes I've ever taken. Um, I've taken greater motor imagery. I thought that was very good. I've taken mobilization of the nervous system like two times. And I took neuroimmune once. Um, first time I took it, and that's going to kind of segue to my next guy. That was with Adrian Lowe um, from the ISPI Institute, which I'll also link them. He's got really good stuff too. Um, they A lot of the classes are very similar, but don't forget the Bob Marley. <laughs> wow, I'm totally forgetting the Bob Marley. That's terrible. It's amazing what, like, his, uh, Aline was at the class with us. What did he say about Bob Marley? Oh. Anyways, so please tell me, Aline. Um, I'm a big fan of the Noy Group. Take their stuff. What was your other question, Katie? So cognitive functional therapy. Um, you know, I, Katie, I would love to answer that, but I really, I mean, I know Peter O'Sullivan. I've heard him talk, or I've heard some of his talks. I don't know much, of, you know, because I think, I think you can get changes 
in people and improvements multiple ways. What what is the intent and the rationale for doing so? And what is the goal? How are you going to execute that? And then what is the outcome that you're looking for? Um, you know, over bracing, you know, for what context in this example, just so I can kind of not give you a non-answer, Katie. Um, I, you know, if, if you're going to be lifting a heavy, um, but like just to contract things very heavily, I, I don't know. I don't, you know, I don't see as much value in that, especially with some of the infrasternal angle stuff that I've been playing with. You know, if you have someone who's got a narrow infrasternal angle, they're already well braced. And so to reinforce that even further, probably not going to be helpful. Um, someone with a wide, hey, uh, maybe they have a hard time bracing period. So. Um, maybe something along those lines is a little bit more beneficial, um, but it really depends on. Like I'm not, I'm not offended really by most treatments. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Elaine. Um, I'm not really offended by most treatment selections that people do, assuming it gets the result you're looking for and the result that's meaningful for the patient. Get it with overbracing for sure. Whatever you know, it's not what I would do, but I, I don't care. It's like you get the outcome. Focus on coordinating, like, so Katie said, focusing on coordinating pelvic floor, diaphragm, and period abdominal and specific exercises. I try to keep things, now I will use some internal based cueing um, and ask for awareness on lower intensity type things. So it, when I'm trying to establish variability, because I want to ensure that the person is making or feeling what they need to feel to get in the position that they need to get into. Like, I think some of that stuff is a bit more appropriate, but to try to do that on a loaded exercise, like a squat or a deadlift or something along those lines, I don't find much use for that. You want to try to make these things happen a bit more reflexive, unless that's the only way you can get them to perform the movement correctly. That would be maybe one example in which maybe I would do that, but it's just not something that I that I do much of, you know. Um, I I try to cue them into the positions they need to go as opposed to being or feeling what they need to feel, unless I'm trying to drive a specific change. For example, if if I need to improve someone's hip extension, I need them to make sure that they're feeling their hamstrings contract. Um, so I know that they're working what they need to work to jeans. Andrew from Facebook. Um, hypertonic or tight lats. So like limitations in external rotation or shoulder flexion. That is a great question, Andrew, because this is actually kind of one I've been trying to trying to work my way through. Um, top priority, first and foremost, is axial skeleton. I'm gonna beat this dead horse. Um no, uh, I, I, yeah, I'm, if you address the axial skeleton and foremost, these things might clean up. So, you know, look at infrasternal angle, look at how well they can rotate the thorax, look at lumbar spine, look at pelvis, look at first rib, look at neck, look at all these things. Address that first, see what shakes out. Because a lot of times you can influence the tonicity of the lats by addressing these areas. Look at the scap position. So if I have someone who is limited in flexion, external rotation, after I've done all that, potentially the case that the scap's a little bit more retracted. Okay, if I retract the scap, what's gonna happen? Well, th this, this position goes here, Subscap gets a little bit more active and kind of trying to aid pulling that this way um, because you might fall in a little bit more of an IR position at the humerus, protract and upwardly rotate to be able to get into flexion. Some of these limitations may be present because of that. So what do you gotta do with that? Well, protract the scapula, fix the scapular positioning. If they're here, Find activities that get them here. Or, you know, if, if it's like a retraction elevation, you want to try to get maybe some depression and, and protraction. If it's retraction depression, maybe it's more protraction elevation. So maybe you're, you know, if you're a fitness cat, you're doing landmine, land, land, 
planned mind based pressing, um, those types of things. So that's what I would look for first. Then, only then, if they still have some limitations present after you've cleared scapular positioning, which I very rarely see, um, you know, having to go more locally at the shoulder, but but sometimes you may. Um, what I would would I get the subscap to to relax so we can kind of let that further go into external rotation? How would I do that? You can use some type of manual intervention there. You can use, um, you know, just some like get the get the cuff kicking in in that position. Sometimes I've restored motion that way. Same thing with shoulder flexion. Um, do things that get the lat to relax, whether it's a manual technique or some type of lat-based stretching or, or inhibition or whatever you want to call that. I don't really care. Um, so the, the treatment hierarchy is still really, really the same. You go after axial skeleton, you go after the appendages, and you just like start here and then work your way out. Oftentimes you will get an improvement in motion. And sorry I'm blowing up right now, people. Andrew, good question. Summarize, start here, work your way out, and you'll be in business. But I mean, it's just like guys with a lot of, and, and, and I'm not saying this, um, I'm not saying this to be, what's the word? I don't even mean to say anything. But um, please uh, let me know if that's not clear. Um, but like with a lot of this stuff, if you know, the anatomy and you can kind of think positionally what's going on based on anatomical what what you're seeing in your objective assessment you can really kind of problem solve through these things even if it's something good i'm glad you liked it andrew even if it's something you haven't seen before or it doesn't make sense it's think about what what you're trying to do like where you need to go think about what what things can get you there whether it's putting the body in a particular position, whether it's getting certain muscles to kick in, whether it's increasing excursion of the nervous system, any of these things. Think about what it is from an anatomical standpoint that's going to drive you to where you want to go. Find or create. create. It like it, the, the specific exercises don't matter. It's like create some type of activity or in some position that's going to get you there where you want to go and then retest and see if you got the outcome you wanted. And if you do that with any of these interventions, I, like it doesn't matter. Like you don't even have to assess things the way I do. I'm not saying I have all the answers. I, no, I'm, I'm still learning things. That's why I'm, you know, I got just got this book right here because I'm still trying to figure some stuff out. Malignment syndrome, by the way, it's kind of interesting stuff in there. Um, but yeah, like just, just, just think through, problem solve. Figure out a model that works for you. Understand to do with some of my online endeavors and, and, and just what I try to do when I'm trying to improve someone's movement capabilities. And not just movement, but even when I'm educating someone on sleep. You know, I had a guy yesterday who's like been 30 years and the guy hasn't 30 years. And it's like, man, what is what is physiologically going on because of that sleep deprivation? And if you understand what physiologically happens because of sleep deprivation, then you know it's like, okay, well, I know how, how sleep works, roughly. I know what physiologically can happen when sleep is impaired. Then you make your interventions. Again, you have your intents of what you're trying to change. You execute those intents, or the, the client executes, and then you retest and see if you make a positive change. If you do that stuff, you're in business. So if you just apply that that thought process to everything you do, you can help a lot of people and you can probably help yourself in a lot of aspects of life. And I think that's a good stopping point for today. Unless people be asking me some questions as I give my little spiel. You're probably wondering, where can you find out more? Go to ZachCouples.com. So get, you're gonna get access to the free talk that I gave on Monday, Practical Pain Education. And guess what, peeps? I got another exclusive talk coming out Monday. Get ready for it, fam. It's going to be a doozy. So if you do that first, you'll also get a free acute to chronic workload calculator. You'll get a free basketball conditioning program. You'll get some other stuff that you might have a harder time finding on the interwebs. Subscribe to the newsletter. While you're there, you may want to check out some of the online services that I have to offer. For example, Lucy, respect. 
Yo, I'll text you later. Lucy and I are having a, an interesting conversation. Um, <laughs> so, um, online services. Lucy is one of the people who works with me with movement, kind of having struggles with, or maybe you, you're, you know, you're just uh, someone who needs a little bit of help moving a little bit more effectively. Maybe you got a few aches and pains. You know, you got it medically checked out, and things are okay. And you're just trying to figure out: is there another way I can look at this problem? This joker might be able to help you. Go ahead and check me out there. I also offer mentoring. Got some problems that need solving from a movement-based standpoint, or some of the things I talked about today. Maybe you want to look at a little bit more in depth. Maybe you want some career advices. Maybe you want editing of things. Because I edited all "Game No Pain" by Bill Hartman. What? We'll put that on the list, people. Um, A G N P. Um, yeah, check me out. I can mentor you. I can help you because I know it's very hard to find good mentors. Because I, I know that's a that's a struggle I have. You know, I get certain mentors who can help me with this thing, this thing. But if there's a specific problem that I have and I can't find the right person, maybe I can be that right person for you. Dana, yo, ask Dana Harrelson. She's one of the mentees. She gets it, and she's doing well. She's kicking butt. So there's that. Also offer online fitness training. Do you want to drop some fat? Are you post rehab? You are, are you an athlete and you want to perform at a higher level? Those would probably be the things you can come check me out with. Check me out for online training. Once you've scoured ZachCouples.com and you've read every single article that I've ever written, check me out on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash ZCouples. If you've worked with me, I would really love it if y'all reviewed and said, hey, he's okay. And hey, he's not a jerk. Um, um, like, check that out. So go to facebook.com forward slash Z couples if you want to write a review. Zach, Z Zach couples PT. <laughs> Dang, Katie, you working early, girl. Well, sleep well. Um, I'm glad you like my stuff. I appreciate you tuning in. I appreciate your readership. So that's Facebook. Where else can you find me? Instagram, baby. Instagram, Zach, Z-A-C, couples, C-U-P-P-L-E-S. I'm also on Twitter. Sometimes I write things that are, you know, in my mind, and I don't want to write a long thing about them. Go to Instagram, or not Instagram, Twitter. My handle is at Z couples. You can also find me on YouTube. Just search Zach Couples. There's stuff on there that like I don't really post anywhere because maybe it's like a video for a client or something like that. And so if you want to see like what kind of exercises is Zach doing nowadays, you can probably check that out. Otherwise, you wonderful, sexy people, stay classy. Keep it real, but not to the extent where things go wrong. Stay hungry, stay learning, stay moving. And I will see you next time. Deuces.